Welcome to this video lecture where we'll be continuing our discussion on one-dimensional steady-state conduction. Specifically though, we'll be moving to radial systems and talking about a cylindrical wall system. So when we're talking about cylindrical systems, especially one-dimensional cylindrical systems and their temperature profile, we mean that uh, temperature is only varying in the R direction. So we do not have temperature variation in the Z direction and we also do not have temperature variation in the phi direction, only in the r direction, going out radially from the center. And often we will talk about um, hollow cylinders where you get a cylindrical wall, or you might have a, a hollowed out section like in a pipe here. And so when we're talking about conduction, we're talking about heat transfer from this inner wall of the pipe outward to the outer wall of the pipe. I'm showing here the heat equation for radial systems, which we introduced in chapter two of these lectures. So if we were to look at the heat equation, we can eliminate terms where we're not expecting a temperature gradient in that particular direction. So let's go ahead and we and look at this equation. So we, we do have temperature variation in the R direction, so we need to keep that term. However, we do not have temperature variation in the phi direction or in the z direction. So phi again is the angle and z is actually axially down the length of the cylinder. We are also going to be talking explicitly about systems that have no generation and that are at steady state, so they have no accumulation term. So if we break down this equation, we see that we no longer need the partial derivative signs on our temperature, we, because temperature is only varying as a function of one other variable, which is the radius. So we can reduce the heat equation, in this particular instance, down to this um, simple one-dimensional form of the heat equation. We've already solved problems like this, where we've gone ahead and solved this for a radial system, so I won't go through that derivation at length, but I will remind you that we took this equation and we integrated twice to get this form. We see that our temperature varies according to a constant multiplied by the natural log of the radius plus another constant of integration. And if you recall, this is a, a second order PDE, so for each spatial dimension in which it's second order, we will need one boundary condition. So because it's second order, we need two boundary conditions. So those boundary conditions, the generic boundary conditions, are these constant surface temperature boundary conditions. So the temperature at R equals R1, or this inner radius, is equal to some known temperature TS1, and the temperature at R equals R2, or this outer radius, is equal to some known temperature TS2. So applying those boundary conditions to solve for C1 and C2, we can plug in those specific conditions into that generic form of the equation and we can solve, do some algebraic rearrangements, and we can get this temperature profile. So we've done this before. If you want to go through it in more depth, you'll have to go back to the example problem where we integrated the heat equation for a cylindrical system. So we're left with this temperature profile and I want to remind you that the temperature profile is no longer linear as it is for the plane wall system. Here, temperature varies as a nonlinear function of, of radius. Okay, so I want to take a minute to have you reflect. So let's think about this system. Let's, um, let's think about a, a cylindrical system where we have, in this particular case, we have this innermost cylinder shown in gray that generates heat. So this could be a nuclear rod that's surrounded by some kind of cladding or insulation. It could be a reaction happening in there. Um, it doesn't really matter so much. So the question is, if we have this generation term here, at steady state, where will the heat flux, Q double prime sub R, be the highest? Will that occur here? at r equals r1, here at r equals r2, or here at r equals r3. And you can go ahead and hit pause while you think about this. Okay, so where will the flux be the highest? So we're going to have heat being generated here. So that heat is being generated. It's going to have to get out of our system somehow. So that heat is going to be leaving our system. So if it's generated here in this smallest innermost cylinder, um, it's going to be most concentrated here. 
and then a little less concentrated here, less concentrated here, and less concentrated here. So in terms of the specific radii at which I'm asking, the, the flux will be the highest at R equals R1, because that corresponds to that same rate of heat transfer distributed over the smallest area. Whereas you go out to R2 or R3, that heat is going to be dissipated and it's going to be spread out over a larger and larger area that's normal to the flow of heat. So our flux, we would expect it to be uh, highest the closer you get into that to where the heat is being generated. And we can actually verify that by looking at this temperature profile that we derived previously. So if we wanted to figure out what our flux is, if you recall, our flux in the R direction is going to be equal to minus K, where K is the thermal conductivity, times dt dr. So what we would need to do would be differentiate our dt with respect to r and then multiply that by minus k. So we would end up getting that this quantity is equal to minus k times the derivative of our temperature profile which is ts1 minus ts2 divided by the natural log of r1 over r2 so it's just we take this coefficient here, and then the derivative of natural log of r is 1 over r, so we pick up this extra r term in the denominator. So this actually does confirm that our flux will get, um, it will get smaller and smaller in magnitude the further out we go, because our denominator gets bigger and bigger. So Fourier's law proves what we thought about conceptually. All right, let's ask another thought question. This one's a little bit different. A cylindrical system has an innermost cylinder, shown in gray, that generates heat uniformly. At steady state, where will the heat transfer rate, Q sub R, be the highest? At R1, R2, or R3? Okay, so now we are no longer asking about flux. We're asking about the total rate of heat transfer. So I'm gonna give you a second to pause and think about what your answer might be. Okay, so this one is actually a trick question because it's going to be the same whether you measure it at R1, R2, or R3. The total rate of heat transfer is going to be the same. And that's because as we go out radially, so keep in mind we have this energy being generated here. That energy needs to get out somehow. So eventually it's going to conduct all the way through all of those layers and convect out here to some kind of air or fluid out here. So ultimately that heat is getting all the way through our system and it doesn't matter where we measure it, that total rate of heat transfer is going to be the same. So we have this constant flow of heat from um, from here, the outer edge of this generation, all the way out. The heat and we're, while the heat is being gradually dissipated, the flux is lower, the actual rate of heat transfer is going to be the same because our R encompasses about, um, well our, our area encompasses that entire area, so the area will grow in addition to, um, sorry, our area will continue to grow and it, that's going to negate the shrinking flux as we go outward. So again, let's verify this mathematically. So if we looked at our temperature profile to calculate the total flow of heat, we would use this equation. So QR is equal to minus K times area times dt dr. So this is going to be equal to minus K times 2 pi R times L, where L is going to be the total length of our pipe, times dt dr. So again, if we go through, take our uh, take the derivative of our temperature profile, we would get that our QR is equal to minus K times 2 pi L, and then I'm going to keep the R in there for now, multiplied by our, our flux, or sorry, this is going to be included in our flux. Um, so we're going to get TS1 minus TS2 divided by the natural log of R1 over R2. So 
again, our temperature derivative, and we still had this R term, so um, I wish I had done this a little bit differently, but let me give this a shot now. So these parts of the equation is represents the flux, and then we multiply that flux by the area. And as you can see, we get these R's canceling out, and this is significant. This is an important result because we see that the total flow of heat is going to be constant with respect to R. Here it is in the way that our textbook puts it, and notice that they get rid of the negative sign, and they do that by flipping uh, these natural log terms, but mathematically these two terms are equivalent. Okay, so let's remember this. So QR is a is um, equal to 2 pi LK times our temperature difference divided by the natural log of R2 over R1. And notice that every single term in that equation is just a constant. Okay, so this result is important. We are learning that the flow of heat from here out to here as a function of R is just going to be constant. And again, that heat may be spread out over larger and larger areas, which means the flux decreases, but the actual flow of heat is a constant. So what does that mean? This means that we can actually apply this concept of thermal resistance for cylindrical systems as well just as we did for uh, plane wall systems. So let's examine the form of this equation. So again, this is going to be a constant. It depends on our temperature difference and a bunch of other geometrical and property constants of our system. If you remember, when we were talking about thermal resistance for a plane wall system, we used this form. We uh, we took our temperature difference, so we had this delta T, our driving force, divided by R. So we had driving force over thermal resistance. So by inspection you can notice that we could take this equation and rearrange the terms to put it into this form. We would just be lumping these constants together into a single term. So if we did that rearrangement, we would actually see that the total thermal conductive resistance through a cylindrical wall is equal to this, the natural log of its outer radius divided by its inner radius, and then that whole quantity divided by 2 times pi times the length of the cylinder times the thermal conductivity of the cylinder. So notice that it depends on thermal conductivity, so the higher thermal conductivity we'll get means the lower thermal resistance we'll get. Similarly, if we make the pipe longer, uh, making the pipe longer would mean that we have more area for heat transfer, so more heat transfer will happen, which also means that the thermal conductivity will go down. If we made it thinner, so we had, if we reduced R2 but kept R1 the same, if we made it thinner, this term on top would get smaller, which means our um, thermal, total thermal resistance would also get smaller. Okay, so here's how you might apply this thermal cir circuit concept to use that um, thermal resistance to a cylindrical system. So in this particular system we have a fluid going through, we have our cylindrical wall with radius R1 and R2, so we have convection happening on the inside and convection happening on the outside. So just like in the plane wall system we have convective thermal resistances, so those are shown here. Here is the inner convective thermal resistance and here is the outer convective thermal resistance. Note that those take on the exact same form as they did in the plane wall system where that convective thermal resistance is just equal to 1 over HA. However, our A isn't just length times width, it's now 2 pi R times L. It's basically just the surface area of a cylinder. So here we have the surface area of the inner part of the cylinder, here we have the surface area of the outer part of the cylinder. And then between those two terms we have our conductive thermal resistance. So again we can build a thermal circuit just like we did before where we have the convective thermal resistance on the inside, we have the conductive thermal resistance through the cylindrical wall, and then we have the convective thermal resistance on the outside of that wall. And we can quantify the total flow of heat going all the way from inside to outside
by summing up those three thermal resistances because they are thermal resistances in series and we can go back and apply this definition. So we could lump all of those things together. If we knew what all those terms were, our heat transfer coefficients and our conductive thermal resistance, notice that this form goes, it just considers the conductive thermal resistance. So we just use our surface temperatures. However, this form, we're going to use um, our fluid temperatures on each side, and we're going to include those three resistances. So this thermal circuit goes the whole entire way. But we could use this, we could equate the thermal resistances and use this to go back and back solve for TS1 or TS2 or whichever one we would like. So we can also have cylindrical composite walls, and this is actually more common than you would think. So you could have a pipe that's carrying some fluid at its center. So here's the pipe itself, and that may have layers of insulation or it may have some other kind of coatings on it. So this is actually a more common system than you would think when you get insulated and coated pipes. So if you notice, here's our temperature profile. Um, so this is a plot of temperature versus R that is superimposed over the top of this diagram. So as you can see, we have this temperature drop by convection. And then if you remember, our temperature profile is nonlinear for, for a cylindrical system. So you see this nonlinear logarithmic shape of our temperature profile through each wall section. And then again, we have convection here happening at the outer um, layer. So in this case, we would have five thermal resistances. We'd have an inner convection. We'd have these three thermal resistances, three conductive thermal resistances through uh, layers A, B, and C, respectively. And then we would have this outer thermal resistance as heat uh, is transferred by convection out into an outer fluid. Okay, so if we wanted to quantify the total flow of heat, as I mentioned before, we would sum up our thermal resistances to get our R total, and then we would uh, put that quantity in our denominator and take our overall temperature difference in the numerator. So that would give us the total flow of heat from inside to outside. Um, so this is a really nice way. There's a whole lot going on here. And one approach could be that we solve the heat equation with convection boundary conditions. However, we'd have to solve the heat equation three separate times for each material and then enforce boundary conditions at all of these boundaries. Or if we wanted to just quantify the total flow of heat, we could just apply this thermal resistance method. So at steady state, when we have constant thermal conductivity in each of those sections, and when there's no generation happening within our system, this is a very useful method to apply. This concept of the overall heat transfer coefficient for a radial system also applies. So if we were to take that same rate equation with our R total there in the denominator, we can take this whole equation and we can equate that to another form that looks a lot like Newton's law of cooling, where our total flow of heat is equal to U, where U is our overall heat transfer coefficient, times our surface area, times our temperature difference. And of course, the way to get there is, I mean, the way to go back and forth between total thermal resistance and this UA quantity is just by taking the inverse of our total thermal resistance to get our heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area. So this U is analogous to H when we are just talking about pure convection systems. However, this U has all of this information embedded within it. So this is a very useful for designing and evaluating the performance of heat exchangers, for example. Okay, so quick question. If we wanted to quantify U, or we wanted to know what is the overall heat transfer coefficient of, say, a heat exchanger or, a, or even just a pipe, how do we go about figuring out U if we know the total thermal resistance? Specifically, which area do we use? So you notice that area, which is going to be equal to 2 pi r l, is variable. The area changes as r changes. So if we measured area here at r equals r1, or here at r equals r2, we're going to get two different areas. So which one do you use to quantify specifically which u you are using? So this is somewhat arbitrary, but you actually would pick 
where you are evaluating your U. So as area grows, our U actually shrinks because this quantity UA is constant no matter where you measure it. So that product UA is constant because the total flow of heat is constant and our overall temperature differences is constant. However, because A is not constant, you sort of have to arbitrarily pick how you're defining U. So notice that if we defined U, we could define U, um, we could define U here at R equals R1, or here at R equals R2, here or here, at any of these radii, and we would get this quantity U times A is constant, and they're always equal to the inverse of the total thermal resistance. So we would pick, if we had a pipe system and someone asked us, what is U for this pipe system, we would say, well, U is a certain value, and we define this as the U as determined by the inner radius. So if we wanted to find, figure out the inner radius, we or find out U based on the inner radius, we would take our system and divide through by 2 pi R1 times L, and we might get something that looks like this. So our U1, or U defined at this area, the, the inner radius of our cylindrical wall, would come out to look like this. But this would look different, obviously, if you measured this at R2 or R3 or R4. And typically, it would be kind of silly to think about defining this somewhere in the middle of some pipe wall. You would typically define this at either the inner or the outer radius. But this is a, some useful tools for analyzing cylindrical systems using this thermal resistance method and using an overall heat transfer coefficient.